Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to open this session on the rule of law with, with a stellar lineup uh, of speakers uh, on behalf of the CEU's uh, Democracy Institute, uh, Reconstitution and Reconnect, which are the co-organizers of today's event. Um, the CEU Democracy Institute is based in Budapest and it strives to enable the renewal and strengthening of democratic and open societies through world-class research, collaboration across academic and professional disciplines, and teaching and a free exchange of ideas and public engagement, also on the local, regional, and global scale. Now, today's discussion will prove um, to serve these goals, uh, since we are looking at the Court of Justice's case law uh, uh, with excellent experts. Now, the rule of law backsliding in two countries against which Article 7 procedures have been started, namely Hungary and Poland, revealed uh, the EU's significant vulnerabilities in the face of the need to uphold the values that the whole system of European integration, the whole European idea, if you wish, um, is based on. Um, the lessons uh, from rule of law backsliding in some of the member states um, are revealing, respecting the acquis, uh, respecting EU law as such, does not guarantee continuing adherence to article uh, to uh, values, to the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights, and other, uh, other values enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty. And economic su success in the European Union does not necessarily entrench democracy and the rule of law. What we have also learned is that the tools are heavily underused by both EU institutions and also the member states to enforce the rule of law and other values um, in the member states. Now, what stands out from this um, grim picture is the revolutionary case law of the Court of Justice on judicial independence and on mutual trust, um, which bridges the available infringement procedures with the outstanding problems and offers empowerment to the EU's decentralized judiciaries, um, while also resolving some competences conundrum through a broad reading of the principle of judicial independence, uh, which is, of course, a key element of the rule of law. Um, now, the background reading uh, that is also uploaded to the website um, of this workshop is a paper or, or a document that uh, the co-authors nicknamed as a paper um, to be published by the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies, but actually it's a book uh, called Respect for the Rule of Law in the Case Law of the European Court of Justice. And the co-authors are Laurent Pesch and Dimitri Kochanov whom I very um, uh, warmly welcome here. Laurent Pesch is a professor of European law and head of the law and policy department at the Middlesex University London. He is also a visiting professor of law um, at uh, Bordeaux and, as a senior, and is a senior research fellow at the CEU's Democracy Institute. Uh, Professor Pesch specializes in EU public law and is currently a member of the editorial board of the Hague Journal on the Rule of Law um, and is also a member uh, with the rest of us in the Horizon 2020 project uh, Reconnect. In his spare time, he's, he's trolling autocrats with well-founded research outcomes um, and he also co-founded the Good Lobby Professors, um, uh, co-directed uh, with another Reconnect fellow, Joel Grogan. Um, Professor Kochanov um, is research professor and head of the Rule of Law Research Group at the CEU Democracy Institute in Budapest, and he is also a professor at CEU Department of Legal Studies um, in Vienna. He had visiting prof uh, uh, professorships across the world from Princeton to Oxford to NYU, uh, Basel Institute, um, Osaka, um, and countless other <laughs> universities and served as the founding chairman of the Investment Migration Council. Now, Professor Kochanov frequently advises governments and international organizations on the subject um, that we are also covering today and beyond. His latest monograph is one of his, on his um, other favorite su uh, pet subject, which is, which is citizenship with MIT Press. Uh, last but not least, uh, um, another CEU alumni uh, is uh, on the speaking panel. 
uh, Barbara Gravoska Moros, who is a research fellow at the CU Democracy Institute. And she is also a postdoc researcher in the Reconnect project. Uh, before um, she joined us in Reconnect, she was working with the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights and uh, was a legal expert for FRANET, uh, for the European Union's Fundamental Rights Agency. Um, she graduated from Warsaw University and Central European University, and she defended her PhD on the oversight of the special security services in Poland. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome you three uh, today and would kindly ask you to give a brief introduction of five minutes each um, on the paper uh, that, you, um, 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 that you drafted that, that is likely uh, to be uh, published in the coming days uh, by CEPS. And I would kindly ask you, Barbara, then uh, to comment on what has been said. Um, and in 15 minutes, we move to question and answer time. Laurent, the floor is yours. Thank you, Petra, and uh, thanks to the CEU the Democracy Institute for hosting us uh, today, and thanks, obviously, to the partners you have already mentioned, uh, Petra. So just uh, perhaps uh, the personal background uh, behind this uh, casebook, uh, so paper, aka uh, uh, book, uh, aka casebook. So essentially, we were approached, Dimitri and myself, uh, by the Swedish Institute for European uh, Policy Studies uh, in during spring uh, 2020. Initially, uh, uh, we were thinking of producing a kind of a you know 20 page long uh, report. Uh, the uh, the goal was to essentially summarize the case law of the Court of Justice regarding judicial independence. And uh, we quickly came to the realization that it's very difficult uh, to summarize uh, this considering the volume of the case law uh, starting with uh, the Portuguese judges uh, judgment of 2018 in 20 pages, especially since it's a moving target. In fact, uh, let me just give you a figure just to appreciate uh, the challenge of uh, essentially making sense of the case law of the Court of Justice and or even summarizing it. Um, so, so we, uh, we have used uh, the Portuguese judges uh, ruling uh, as a starting point, which is essentially uh, from our point of view, uh, the court's answer to uh, what you have described uh, Petra's rule of law backsliding in the EU. Uh, why is it called the Portuguese judges ruling, by the way, because it was a dispute initiated by the Trade Association of Portuguese Judges, uh, which then ended up uh, in Luxembourg. So this is a preliminary ruling case originating uh, from Portugal, and we should be grateful to the Portuguese Trade Association of Judges uh, for making it uh, possible uh, to, um, for the Court of Justice to essentially uh, give life uh, to uh, uh, the principle of effective legal protection, judicial protection, to be found post the Lisbon Treaty in the second subparagraph of Article 19, uh, 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 19 one of the TEU. So we have used uh, this uh, ruling, uh, key ruling of the Court of Justice as a starting point. Why do I need to emphasize key ruling? Uh, in fact, uh, during a Reconnect uh, event, uh, President Lennartz of the Court of Justice uh, described the Portuguese judges' ruling as being on par with Costa and Wangen. So just to give you an idea that according to the Court of Justice itself, uh, Portuguese uh, judges is very much uh, in the top uh, of the constitutional uh, rulings ever issued uh, by the Court of Justice since the start of European integration. Um, now, on the basis of, you, uh, of these Portuguese judges' rulings, uh, I have counted a few days ago that we have seen about more than 50 national requests for preliminary ruling asking the Court of Justice to essentially um, answer questions relating to, this, to the scope of application and the impact of uh, the principle of effective judicial protection. Uh, so when we, just on the basis of essentially the Portuguese judges ruling. On top of this, we have also four infringement actions. Uh, two have been already decided by the Court of Justice, uh, two infringement actions against Poland. In both cases, uh, Polish authorities uh, lost. There are two pending, uh, two additional pending infringement actions, um, which we also uh, have uh, mentioned in passing in the case book. Uh, one will be decided very soon. This is about the new disciplinary regime for judges in Poland. Uh, my educated guess is that uh, Polish authorities will lose uh, this case and they will lose badly. 
And the most recent one is about uh, Poland's so-called Mazel law. Uh, most likely the court won't issue a judgment on the merits before the end of next year. Uh, but this month, most likely, we will get an interim uh, order. Uh, we will get an order from the Court of Justice uh, suspending for the second time the so-called disciplinary chamber of the Court of Ju uh, the disciplinary chamber of Poland's uh, Supreme Court, which is kind of a, a sham, unlawful body continuing to operate, uh, notwithstanding its previous suspension. By decided ruled by the Court of Justice in April 2020. So the case book is essentially trying to. Uh, present in a type of case by case basis uh, the, the overall case law of the Court of Justice. Uh, this was challenging not only because uh, from, uh, from a volume point of view, uh, so more than 50 preliminary uh, ruling uh, requests, uh, 13 so far have been decided. Uh, we have had also a very interesting uh, groundbreaking interim orders. Uh, they are also mentioned in the case book and then also the two infringement actions uh, which have already been decided on the merits. And we have decided, uh, because we need to stop at some point, we have decided to use the so-called Maltese uh, judges ruling as a provisional endpoint. Uh, in, in, in effect, I think we can say that uh, with these two, with the Portuguese judges ruling and the Maltese judges ruling, uh, I would say the la boucle boucle, to use a French expression, what started already with the Portuguese judges ruling essentially now has been completed with the Maltese judges ruling. Uh, what is it about? In one sentence, uh, you can otherwise read what uh, Dimitri has written uh, on this uh, ruling already for the Verfassung's blog. Um, in the Mal uh, judges uh, ruling. Why do I call it the Malti judges ruling? By the way, because it does originate uh, from uh, Morta, another preliminary ruling uh, request, initiated by NGO, which is also quite interesting. Uh, this time, not a trade uh, union or trade association of judges, but by an NGO, Republica. Uh, and in this uh, very important uh, ruling, the Court of Justice has introduced the principle of non regression uh, when it comes to judicial independence, which means now, uh, the Commission can sue a member state uh, post accession to the EU if uh, they adopt so called uh, judicial reforms or, more exactly, judicial deforms uh, to undermine judicial independence. So, essentially, what started with Portuguese judges' ruling has been completed by the Court of Justice um, in the Maltese judges' ruling, but uh, I can answer, I can give you more details uh, later. Uh, let me just uh, conclude by saying that uh, we're hoping that our case book uh, uh, is published uh, by uh, the Swedish Institute uh, most likely this month. And our long-term plan, but Dimitri can confirm, uh, is that we would like to uh, publish uh, possibly uh, kind of the same case book, but perhaps in a more accessible uh, uh, way. Uh, with a, a legal publisher, uh, most likely uh, next year, because essentially we have plenty of interesting case law in the pipeline, especially about the issue, which we can discuss later, of what I call uh, fake judges irregularly appointed uh, to uh, national courts to undermine judicial independence from within. So thank you very much, Petra. And sorry for exceeding my five minutes. But I'm sure Dimitri and Barbara won't mind. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for giving us the possibility to have a glimpse at this very impressive case law by the Court of Justice. And without further ado, I just hand over to Dimitri now. So essentially, uh, the, 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 the working title of the case book, which not all the reviewers liked, was the, the EU rule of law revolution. And I think this, uh, this working title would be something that goes along very well with, uh, with in indeed how the court itself views its recent case law. Why? Uh, the, the constitutional significance of this case law is overwhelming because it suddenly gives the EU legal system a firm base in the values as legal principles rather than as proclamations. What was, uh, what was the biggest uh, uh, a problem uh, with, uh, with uh, EU law until Portuguese judges. Uh, Article 2 was not seen by all, all those concerned, including the institutions, including the member states, and including all the potential litigants as an ordinary part of the acquis unionaire, if I can, if, if, if I can phrase it uh, in that way. So Article 2 was not seen as uh, fully incorporated into the legal justiciable uh, part of EU law. And what the court has done effectively through Article 19 is building the bridge between the values 
and the law as it, uh, as it stood indeed since Van Hanten laws. And this bridge is overwhelmingly important because usually when we think about any mature constitutional system, uh, what we see is drawing on the values precisely and using the whole body of the law in order to make sure that those, those values receive full material uh, embodiment. Uh, in, the, in the way how the system functions. This is not what the union was based on because the union proclaimed and, uh, and informs the procl in, enforced the proclamation of adherence to the values while not really going into the values, legally speaking, and this has entirely changed. So since three years ago, the EU legal system is a constitutional system, not merely based on a proclamation, but drawing firmly on the foundations of own law. And besides 19 then, the, 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 where the union uh, found its competence to connect the values with the core of the constitutional system, uh, the, this bridge also allowed to, to build on substance, to, to develop interim measures, uh, to think about enforcement. So uh, we have a radically different constitutional landscape of engagement with the law of values now three years after, after the Portuguese judge's ruling uh, compared with what we had before. And of course, the, the implications of this go for, far beyond the crisis of values that we are facing today, especially in Poland, but, uh, but, but also in Hungary with the backsliding, uh, because now the, the whole nature of the constitutional system has been transformed and all further challenges will already be approached necessarily in the light of uh, what has been achieved using the ongoing, uh, the ongoing uh, problems uh, as a trigger. So I, I, I will leave uh, the, the substance to the question and dance the session. And I think uh, underlining this constitutional essence of what, of what has happened and what has been documented by uh, Laurent and me in the, in, in the case book is, is, is the most fundamental point that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for this concise introduction into what the gist of the, of the matter is. Um, and now we hand over to Barbara, who talks about the most recent uh, case law of the Court of Justice, if I'm not mistaken. Please, Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you. If I just may um, link um, a little bit to, to what Laurent and uh, Dimitri just have said, I think uh, if, you, if you look at, at this report, you can see that the whole revolution that Laurent and Dimitri were, was mentioning is not a homogeneous picture. I mean, you can see so many two sides of the same coin, depending on the topic. You can see that on the EU level, you can see a huge development um, of, the, of the EU law, especially Article 2 values. But on the other hand, which authors already mentioned, you cannot see the improvement on the ground in Poland and in, in, in Hungary. On the other way, you can see 50 preliminary requests uh, for rulings and only a couple of infringement actions. Uh, it's so much di more difficult to implement preliminary ruling. And I think AKK shows that when the Supreme Court in Poland wanted to implement it, then the muzzle law appeared and it's now it's a disciplinary offense to, um, to ask uh, the Court of Justice about, about the courts, about the independence of justice. Whereas when you introduce infringement action, it's so much easier to, uh, to check, to oversee the implementation, but the Commission doesn't want to do that. And again, the, the interim measure from um, April 2020 shows that it's so much easier and the Commission doesn't want to use the tools they have on the ground. I also made an exercise yesterday and I checked the website of the Minister of Justice um, since December last year until now. And there I found at least six press releases about the rulings of the Court of Justice. And you can see three types of um, narrative. The first one is we won. And this is about the ruling from December 2020 during with the preliminary reference from Amsterdam, meaning uh, the courts still have to ask about uh, very individual infringement of, uh, of fair trial uh, rights. The second one, the Court of Justice cannot undermine our constitutional order. And the third argument is that it's a double standard um, ruling. Look at the Maltese judges, look at uh, Polish uh, AB case. There are double standards. You cannot um, um, you cannot work like, like that. So that moves me to, to this, my second point. I think what we are witnessing here is a process of 
constitu constitutionalization of the rule of law. I know it's, it's already written in so many sources that the rule of law is a constitutional value of the rule of law, but when you see how painful the process is, I think we are witnessing it just right now. It's, it hasn't happened before. I think this is what is happening right now. And this is what Dimitri also mentioned. The Article 2 wasn't thought as, as something that will be practically um, in, implemented um, by, uh, by the courts, the Supreme, uh, the, the, the Court of Justice, the, the domestic court, but we are witnessing the, the process of implementation and it's not easy one. Um, um, and I think that brings me to my, to my final point, which is um, the picture is not complete. The history hasn't, you know, it's not the, 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 the end of the history when it comes to the rule of law. The first thing is, I think there will be at least the second volume of, of, um, of this report because we can already see the rulings that are being passed, you know, yesterday dealing with Article 7 um, uh, procedure. Um, but it also gives a sense that the picture is extremely complicated for unprofessional actors um, in the member states, in Hungary, in, in, in Poland. If the Court of Justice wants to, you know, make a change um, or if the EU wants to make a change by using the, the rulings of the Court of Justice, then I think that, that we need those, those actors, those uh, lawyers, those you know, public actors that we're going to explain how, how this affects the, um, um, the domestic legal orders. And I think this report is one step that is going to, um, to, to help in this, um, uh, in this process. Which me, brings me to my very last point. I think we're gonna meet again soon with the second volume and, and the rule of law history again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this introduction and especially for pointing out the fakeness and this parallel reality that is being created by the liberals in, in, in misrepresentation uh, and misinterpretation of the Court of Justice judgments. Um, I also um, invite and encourage the audience to ask questions, which I can then uh, translate to our uh, speakers today. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me ask those of you who didn't have a chance uh, to elaborate on the Portuguese judge's case, uh, Dimitri and Barbara, uh, to tell us um, a little more about the, um, the importance of this ruling. Um, and also, um, it's, a, it's a question specifically uh, directed to, to Dimitri. Um, what is the main impact of Republica and how can Article 49 help the court fight rule of law backsliding? Um, perhaps we start with Dimitri right away. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a spectacular question, I think. Uh, and the Republica is, is really superb. It's, a, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite recent cases, uh, and, and there, there have been plenty coming from the Court of Justice. So we have described this uh, over, overwhelmingly positive picture, uh, amazing developments, uh, starting with Portuguese uh, judges uh, on, uh, which uh, which bridge Article 2 and Article 19 also involve the Charter. Uh, but there is one overwhelming problem with all that case law. And that problem is that rule of law actually is something that is infinitely broader than the idea of judicial independence. So if you want to protect, for instance, the, the independence of the, of, the, of the Polish ombudsman, who, is, uh, who has been under attack forever and who, uh, who has now uh, been uh, uh, de facto kicked out, uh, kick out, kicked out from, from office, serving his, uh, his last weeks uh, in, in apparent violation of the constitution, this is something that Article 19, of course, will not uh, cover because the Article 19 is about uh, protecting the dialogue between, between local judges and the judges uh, uh, on Kirchberg and Luxembourg. Uh, so in order to make sure that the case law covers the full breadth of the rule of law and reaches to the full depth of what Article 2 is about, rule of law, democracy, human rights protection, it was absolutely necessary to find uh, an additional passerelle between Article 2 and the rest of, and the rest of their key. And it seems like the uh, Republica judgment, the Portuguese, uh, the, the, the Maltese judges uh, ruling has done precisely that because the Court of Justice has, as, as Laurent has already mentioned, comes up with, a, again, the revolutionary principle of, uh, that, that, that connects Article 49, which is, which is the provision uh, governing the enlargements of the EU 
and which contains a reference, a explicit reference to Article 2, uh, with the requirements that keep on applying after the accession to the Union uh, has been has been completed and became and became a fact. So if we read this judgment broadly, of course, it was very carefully construed by the Grand Chamber. It was, it was connected with Article 19, you know, to make sure that there is clear continuity in the case law. But obviously, if we look at the potential of the judgment, the potential is such that Article 19 as such can actually be dropped. So uh, it, it allows the union to scrutinize, it allows the court to scrutinize any kind of fake uh, anti-reforms uh, at the national level in all the member states against their, uh, their accession date achievements in, in terms of establishing uh, working, uh, working institutional structures and in terms of adherence to the values, uh, which means that it, it allows the court once again to cover the full breadth of the meaning of the rule of law. And uh, probably Laurent would have something to say on this because he has overwhelming work on precisely the meaning of a EU, uh, EU rule of law concept. And now the court has the door open uh, to start a new phase in its case law, protecting the rule of law. Thank you very much. And just a footnote to what, what you have said, Dimitri, on the 21st of April, uh, we made an interview uh, on behalf of the Democracy Institute Rule of Law section with Adam Bodnar, the Polish Ombudsman. So if you want to see the whole saga, uh, please check our YouTube, YouTube channel. Uh, Laurent, do you wish to continue where Dimitri just stopped? Yeah, I mean, just uh, actually uh, very briefly regarding the case mentioned by Barbara, on, uh, you know, from yesterday about Article 7. Uh, what I found uh, very interesting in this uh, case is actually uh, the Hungarian government and the Polish government both uh, relied on Article 2 TEU to actually uh, try to win the case, which would suggest uh, perhaps either that they lack consistency in their legal argumentations, or maybe they have changed their minds uh, regarding uh, the justiciability of Article 2 uh, TEU. Also, interestingly, in this case, and the judgment yesterday, uh, uh, the court made clear that both governments argue for an expensive uh, interpretation of the court's uh, jurisdiction. So I look forward to them explaining the opposite in their pending annulment action uh, directed at the rule of law conditionality regulation. And that being said, so just regarding the Portuguese uh, and the Maltese judges' uh, rulings, um, I mean, Petra and Dimitri, the two of you have referred to the revolutionary uh, case law of the Court of Justice, but I would just slightly perhaps qualify this uh, statement, if I may. Um, from my point of view, it's, the Court has simply uh, essentially addressed a new challenge. So uh, it was possibly an unexpected one. So there was nothing really uh, revolutionary uh, in uh, activating or giving life to Article 19, Paragraph 1. I mean, it was a bold move, uh, but the court could have done so before uh, to deal with a new problem. So in fact, my point here is that what the court is doing is simply fully in line with the current treaty framework, which makes clear that uh, the rule of law uh, is a fundamental value of the EU, that the rule of law is a fundamental value you must comply with uh, prior to EU uh, accession. And the principle of effective judicial protection has always been legally binding. So to that extent, in fact, there's nothing revolutionary here. The, the Court of Justice is simply uh, essentially giving life, as I said, to the treaty provision because it was provided the opportunity to do so. Uh, as you may remember, Petra, you're the expert here, uh, when there was a purge of the senior echelons of the Hungarian judiciary, uh, the Commission could have asked uh, uh, to, uh, for the court uh, to apply the principle of effective uh, judicial protection uh, laid down in Article 90, but instead uh, the Commission relied on the principle of non-discrimination on grounds of age. And in, as a matter of fact, uh, Dimitri, myself, Professor Chepelet, uh, and perhaps others, uh, started arguing uh, as early as 2015 for the activation of Article 19, Paragraph 1 of the TU to protect judicial independence. New problem calls for new answers. So to that extent, I would say the court is just uh, giving essentially uh, full uh, effectiveness to what uh, the treaties already provide for. Uh, that being said, yes, uh, the court is being bold, but just because of the existential challenge, uh, rule of law backsliding, which is in fact a complete rule of law breakdown as far as Poland is concerned now. It's, not, it's no longer backsliding, it's uh, rule of law onslaught, 
we are in Poland now in the current state of complete lawlessness uh, with uh, fake judges, uh, unlawful bodies harassing on an industrial scale, not only judges, prosecutors, and now also uh, lawyers. So this is no longer backsliding, it's a total breakdown, which may lead uh, sooner or later to uh, de facto uh, poll exit. Uh, so in fact, uh, the Court of Justice is doing the job. Uh, but that's, uh, let me just rebound on one of the points made by Barbara, uh, I fully agree with. The Court of Justice is doing the job, but for the Court of Justice to do the job, uh, it needs cases. Uh, the Commission needs to bring more infringement cases, otherwise uh, what the case law has achieved, I mean, it's not going to lead to uh, any uh, tangible results on the ground because essentially the preliminary ruling judgments of the Court of Justice are being completely openly violated, uh, including the orders of the Court of Justice with that any uh, financial consequences uh, to date. Um, and so this is why, I mean, uh, it's great uh, that we see plenty of um, uh, very compelling, uh, very important uh, judgments uh, issued on the basis of the preliminary ruling procedure, but uh, that's not good enough because as Barbara was uh, saying, essentially are, uh, the Polish authorities in particular just uh, refuse to comply with them. In fact, they organize the systemic violation of these uh, judgments. So this is why we need more infringement actions and we need more financial sanctions to come uh, to be essentially asked uh, from the Court of Justice. Um, so uh, yes, so essentially also this explains why national judges are being subject to harassment uh, of a new kind. Uh, I mean, Petra, you mentioned the murder law, uh, but we're seeing also uh, Hungarian judges uh, being uh, frightened into not submitting uh, questions to the Court of Justice. Uh, we had also one or two cases from Bulgaria. Uh, so you just already need uh, to, 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 to do, to frighten national judges, you just need to, you know, do one single example. And then obviously, uh, but this might lead to the worst of, uh, of uh, all the, the worst possible situations. If we have uh, an inactive commission, so the court is not getting the number of infringement actions it should be getting, and then national judges are uh, frightened into submitting questions, then the Court of Justice, essentially the Court of Justice case law, uh, will stop uh, growing, and the case law uh, will just be ignored uh, without any consequences. So this is very much an existential crisis. Uh, I hope uh, personally that the current commission is going to wake up uh, and not uh, too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent. Uh, Barbara, what's your take on the importance of the cases Laurent and Dimitri start with and, and the one that they end their presentation with or paper with? I, I think the, the Portuguese judges, meaning the, the starting point of the, of the whole of the report of the whole casebook, I think it's like um, a good message for, from the Court of Justice saying, you know, in, in this treaty of the European Union, there is a box of box of chocolates and you can you know find whatever you want depending you know on, on the situation but th this optimism what Laurent already mentioned really depends on stakeholders it depends on the commission it depends um, on the on domestic uh, judges it depends also on the member states and i keep in mind the, the rule of law conditionality case pending before the court of justice i think this is the, the huge opportunity for member states to engage in a discussion about the rule of law um, in the EU, especially if we are still missing um, uh, any 259 procedure, meaning sort of private infringement action initiated by any member states. If we see um, statements made by, for instance, by the Dutch government saying we need to protect the EU funds, that's why we need um, EU rule of law conditionality, I think this is a moment when, um, when member states should engage in, the, in, such, um, in such cases. But this you know, box of chocolates idea might turn into Pandora's box if it's not protected uh, correctly. If, if we just leave it to, to member states who are going you know, to argue how the rule of law should be treated and, um, and understood. And uh, as Laurent mentioned, just um, the yesterday judgment shows that the rule of law is, is a sword that can be used um, two ways of, um, in two ways. It can you know, protect uh, values and people or it can be used or abused by those who hold powers to broaden the power even, even more. And when you look what is happening in Poland with the constitutional tribal, uh, tribunal, how, how the, the, the actor that should be defending the values, how should be defending the rights is used by the majority, in fact, to abuse the power, to avoid political process and to undermine uh, human rights. And now here I'm referring to so-called abortion ruling without any political discussion 
the, 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 the rights of half of the society were just deleted. And this can happen when you also use the rule of law argument saying you, we have to publish such ruling um, as well. So, so this Portuguese judges, I think, a case, I think it gives hope, and, but it's kind of a homework for, for all, the, uh, all the stakeholders. And I think reports shows it pretty well. On the one hand, you can see really uh, bright elements such as interim measures, but on the other hand, you can see that there is not, nothing happening after that. So despite uh, co uh, Court of Justice doing the work, we cannot see the commission feeling, um, feeling the guardian of, uh, of the treaties. And I think this is the, the one of the, of the black, um, point, black spots, of, as mentioned in the conclusions. By the way, I really enjoyed the, the, the words and um, you know, reference to black holes or waterboarding, which also appears in the report. So I strongly encourage all to, to read this, this piece. It's, re it's really worth despite its 177 pages. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Um, and um, uh, both you and, and, and Rosa Laurent, you mentioned the responsibility of other institutions, the Commission, we will get to that. But before we do that, um, let me also uh, point to two important elements, two milestones in this developing case law. And the one question is, um, is, uh, is directed to Dimitri, actually. What about the recent Romanian judges ruling that you published on recently? That was, uh, that was another problem that uh, the Court of Justice had to address, and it, uh, it has done it with grace. Uh, and what, so what, what happened in Romanian judges' ruling, the, 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 the Romanian authorities were uh, very busy changing the legal framework uh, that, uh, that, uh, that guides the judiciary in the country uh, to, to such an effect that the rule of law was, uh, in fact, undermined. And uh, there, were, there, were, there were questions concerning the ongoing independence of, uh, of uh, all, the, all the judges concerned. Uh, it's, it's a very complex and long case, we'll not go into details, but what is essential for us, and there are two probably essential things, is that the court seems to be building on Republica, it actually gives, uh, gives a direct reference to Republica in the judgment, uh, saying that it, it, it views its engagement with the rule of law as potentially broader than Article 19, but not in that, not in that case in practice. And in that case, in practice, it also uses the CVM, the, 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 the uh, in, in, instrumentarium that only applies to Romania and Bulgaria after accession. And this is probably the, the, the key added value of the judgment, at least as far as uh, I'm concerned. My, my co-author, uh, Alexei Dimitrov, could, uh, could probably disagree. But uh, what, we, what we, we could present as an added value in the context of the fight for the rule of law the fact that there is the special mechanism that applies to two of the member states, in fact, could also be viewed as a, as a deep problem. And that deep problem is uh, treating different member states differently. This is something that the, the commission overemphasizes in, in, in all of its uh, uh, rule of law documents. And uh, indeed, if, if, if different, different standards would apply to Romania and Bulgaria, then we are not in, in the union as described by the values of Article 2 anymore. And so what the court has done, the court relies on CVM and the court makes direct references to the documents produced in the context of, of that particular legal mechanism. But at the same time, it's absolutely clear from the judgment that CVM is not of essential importance in order to protect Romanian judges against abuse uh, by the powers that be. So CVM is important and CVM is, 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 uh, is active, but CVM is not, uh, is not undermining the principle of uh, equal treatment of all the member states. And this is, I think, probably the, the, this is the main take home uh, lesson from that judgment. But uh, I, I also wanted to say a couple of words about uh, uh, in, in, in a reaction to Barbara, uh, uh, the black holes in, uh, in uh, Advocate General Bobic opinion, I think, uh, will be one of the most uh, frequently quoted uh, uh, references, poetical references to the problems of the rule of law. Uh, the trouble with the outline that we frequently give concerning how different institutions react to the rule of law is that we sometimes forget the court of justice itself. And here some problems can arise if we, if we apply the same standards that the Court of Justice proclaims for the, for the EU legal order as a whole, but mostly, uh, mostly in fact, expect to guide 
the, the national level judges, once we apply that, uh, the problems might arise once we start applying that to, to the court of justice itself. And, 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 and here the whole story of Advocate General Sharpston, the, the whole story of, of the treatment of, uh, of the idea of high level of human rights protection, uh, namely what we see in opinion 213, uh, and, 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 and plenty of similar events uh, where the court seemingly uses the rule of law as a trump card in order simply to restate supremacy either its own or the, the supremacy as the will of the member states the masters of the treaties what happened with the appointment of the of the greek advocate general uh, this is something that doesn't fall uh, squarely in line with uh, with what the court is uh, is proclaiming to be the law and to be the values for the national level so there are still some tensions which which will need to be polished, uh, polished away. And, and finally, one more specific case um, is advocate uh, or a specific opinion is advocate General Tanchev's opinion on an infringement action against Poland for the disciplinary regime against judges. And it was published after the cutoff date uh, of the paper that we are discussing. Uh, but I know, Barbara, you have some thoughts on how to link this case. Uh, to the um, to the main um, objectives of this paper. Um, so I think very briefly, I think it's just another step in the whole picture presented already in the uh, in the in the case book, um, and it's not, definitely not the last um, the, the last word. Of course, we we're gonna see judgment as Lauren mentioned probably quite uh, quite soon. But after the disciplinary regime was introduced, there was also a muzzle law. Uh, introduced, which even makes the whole um, this, this, uh, disciplinary um, even more um, uh, strict, which um, limits the, um, the, the, the the judicial independence. But I think what is really crucial to to um, to look at is how how the court is going to decide and how it's going to um, rule about the possible infringement of Article Two Six Seven. As Lorenzo also mentioned, even though we have a couple of already important and preliminary um, uh, ruling such as AK or AB decided in March um, last year, which by the way, the Minister of Justice said that the Court of Justice cannot intervene in our constitutional um, um, order. This was their comment about the, the, the AB ruling. Uh, we can see that, we can, the, that most probably after the AB, the decision given by the National um, Supreme Administrative Court might be also undermined by the executive. So I think it's very important to see how, how it's going to be um, decided afterwards. I think it's a really crucial element. And for, for, for the huge majority of the cases, this report also shows what is the, um, uh, the update of the, of the cases. But besides that, the Commission uh, versus Poland case, I think it gives something which was already discussed on many occasions, basically uh, ability to introduce uh, disciplinary proceedings against judge because of the content of the decision violates um, uh, the, the, uh, the in independence of, of judges principle uh, as it's de decided and um, um, understood under the EU law. So this is the huge thing that is happening right now. And when you just you know, open any kind of uh, Polish uh, newspaper, you can see that again, the judge is going to be um, heard by the disciplinary chamber. This was the case decided this, this week. Judge Brubel, fortunately, wasn't, uh, he wasn't removed of his uh, immunity. Uh, but it doesn't matter, as, as uh, Laura mentioned, it's about actually chilling, creating chilling effect. So it's for a judge you know, to think twice if he really wants to ask the Court of Justice about the EU law. And I think this is already something which is uh, really troubling uh, from the 267 point of view. Thank you very much. And now that we have discussed specific cases, um, let me ask all of you, but perhaps uh, with Laurent starting, um, an overall question. So in the overall setting, would you say that the uh, Court of Justice did the job, uh, did deliver well when it comes to defending the rule of law and especially judicial independence? And there is a related question uh, coming, to the, uh, coming from the audience. Uh, what are the limits of this case law? The case law under Article 19, um, um, so, uh, so the uh, colleague, um, is developing, but it has its limits. Only the rule of law issues affecting judicial systems can be addressed. Could other rule of law issues be addressed, in particular related to corruption and checks and balances? What would be the legal basis? 
could Article 4090 EU be used as a non-regression clause as interpreted in Republica? Laurent, please. That's quite a few questions for me, but so I'm just going to pick and choose and leave uh, the questions I don't want to answer to Dimitri and Barbara. Uh, before I tell you my overall assessment of the Court of Justice case law, I just wanted um, uh, Barbara, uh, in relation to uh, Barbara presenting the so-called Constitutional Tribunal as a, a court issuing rulings, uh, Barbara, just uh, of course, uh, as you would know, this is not a court, so therefore it cannot issue rulings. So it's a statement uh, regarding abortion uh, issued by the un un unlawful body. I'm very pedantic, but because we're talking about, in fact, the total rule of law breakdown, it's very difficult uh, to actually uh, keep up with the changes. And But the vocabulary is very important. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, non uh, or bodies uh, masquerading as courts and individuals masquerading as judges. We, we should avoid calling them uh, courts. We should avoid calling them uh, judges as far as possible. And in fact, uh, this is a, a very minor criticism of the Court of Justice here. Uh, the Court of Justice still refers to the Constitutional Tribunal uh, post-2016 as a, as a normal court, when in fact the Commission has already established in his Article 7 reason proposal that there is no effective constitutional review uh, of legislation anymore in Poland. And now uh, the European Court of Human Rights has formally established uh, that the so-called constitutional tribunal is in fact uh, unlawfully composed and therefore uh, uh, is not a tribunal established by law uh, whenever it does sit uh, with uh, one of the uh, three uh, so-called uh, usurpers or imposters. Um, uh, so, uh, but this is not my main criticism of the Court of Justice case law, even though uh, I'm being pedantic. So, but uh, good news, uh, the Court of Justice, I think, or at least uh, advocate generals have stopped using uh, the word reform uh, whenever discussing Poland. Uh, black hole is a very nice uh, way of uh, describing what we're talking about. The Polish ambassador Adam Bodnar has also, I think, uh, quite uh, appropriately uh, referred to the creation of an alternative uh, legal space. I think we used to, Dimitri can confirm that the, in the Soviet Union times, we used to talk about dualism, I think, internal dualism. So you had like the proper formal legal system, and then you had the real legal system, uh, I mean, used for the sensitive cases. But I think we, yes, we're talking about an alternative legal space where essentially unlawful, uh, unlawfulness uh, is the norm and not uh, the exception. Anyway, what is my main uh, possible criticism of the Court of Justice case law? I would say uh, the the Selmer uh, case uh, regarding uh, the surrenders uh, to Poland, so on the basis of the framework decision regarding European IS warrants, I think uh, the simply the reasoning of the court uh, does not sustain any serious scrutiny. And in fact, if you compare the judgments uh, LM slash Selmer and uh, the recent one on the basis of a PR from uh, the Amsterdam court, if you compare the, the case law of the court on this uh, front to the legal assessment given to us by A.J. Bobek in, uh, recently in the, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, regarding the Polish practice of seconded judges, Advocate General Bobek said Poland no longer offer, offers minimum guarantees when it comes to the principle of separation of power. I mean, how can we have then still surrenders uh, being organized on the basis of the Selma test when uh, presumption of innocence is systematically no longer uh, guaranteed. Uh, I mean, he, 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 and then yesterday the court confirmed that if you're from Hungary or Poland, you can seek asylum elsewhere in the EU. So the situation is bad enough for a Hungarian citizen to seek asylum in Paris, uh, but uh, it's good enough uh, for, let's say, if, to be surrendered to Hungarian authorities or Polish authorities uh, when, in fact, uh, minimum guarantees regarding separation of powers and uh, judicial independent, um, presumption of innocence is no longer there. So I think this is a weak spot. I understand why the Court of Justice came up with uh, what I think is uh, the flow of reasoning. The Court of Justice was afraid of losing, essentially restricting access uh, to, uh, to it uh, from national judges, but I think the court was misguided. Uh, you can't simply, uh, the criminal law area doesn't have to be subject to the same requirements as uh, Article 267 uh, TFEU request. 
uh, you can uh, simply assess the independence of a specific judge on a case-by-case -case basis when the specific judge is sending questions to the Court of Justice. It's not at all the same situation when we're talking about a suspect to be surrendered in a criminal uh, law context uh, to a court which itself operates within a completely corrupted, systematically uh, captured system. Look at the situation of Poland. That's going to be my last comment. We have the president of the criminal chamber, uh, let me emphasize the criminal chamber of the Polish Supreme Court subject to unlawful fake criminal charges. And he has to defend himself before an unlawful slash unconstitutional body. Uh, how could we contemplate to keep surrendering people to such a system? There is no way you can have a, a fair trial when the president of the criminal chamber of the top court of the country is not itself in a position to be guaranteed a fair trial. I mean, it begars belief. So I think the Selmer line of cases needs to be revisited. I think that's possibly for me uh, uh, the black spot in, in the court, of, otherwise the very compelling uh, case law of the Court of Justice since the Portuguese judges for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I give the floor uh, to the other panelists, uh, let me rephrase this question of how the Court of Justice or what the Court of Justice's role is and how to connect it, uh, how to connect this case law to other areas other than judicial independence. Um, and the two related questions um, um, concern the other institutions on the one hand that are supposed to play their part in defending the rule of law and especially the Commission which is supposed to be guardian of the treaties, including Article 2, TEU, uh, I mean, including also uh, values such as the rule of law, um, and, and, and whether the commission fulfills uh, that role. So whether the commission plays a part in having too few cases related to the rule of law, and what is the consequence of a very conservative approach uh, by the commission, which was uh, fairly well summarized by Commissioner Jourova recently at a, at a Reconnect event, where she said, we cannot afford to lose a case uh, that is related to the rule of law um, in front of the Court of Justice. Um, and here is um, a related question uh, also from the audience. Um, whether, the, um, um, whether the Court of Justice's rulings are to be taken into consideration by other institutions, such as the Commission, for example, in relation to the conditionality regulation or in relation uh, to the Commission's um, annual report. Um, Dimitri, please. Laurent will have uh, will have it more eloquently probably in the in in in, in the coming minutes. But I, I love uh, how he has already characterized the commission in this whole context. The, the commission is uh, is at fault because uh, what we observe is dereliction of duties, and uh, there is no there is no other way. And this is Laurent's words once again. I fully subscribe. There is no other way to describe it uh, because so much has happened and so fast. And uh, well, no, not so fast, so slowly so sometimes uh, in, in full view and in full knowledge of the commission. Well, it could react, it could ask the court uh, the, to, 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 to intervene. It could ask uh, the court to, for interim measures. It could ask to, to speed up proceedings. And in fact, it chose to sit, uh, to sit aside and simply observe. And I think the, the, the greatest example of that is what happened to the Polish Constitutional Court. Uh, the Polish Constitutional Court was slowly dismantled in direct violation of the Polish Constitution itself. And the commission has done absolutely nothing, it was zero. So now if we, and if we turn to the previous question, what, what could be the problem with, uh, with the case law of the Court of Justice? The case law is very compelling, but there is one significant uh, difference uh, between how the Court of Justice views all what we're discussing and how the European Court of Human Rights approaches all what we're discussing. And uh, th this was also subject of, uh, of a debate in uh, Adam Bodnar's uh, meeting several days ago. Uh, and I think if you look at Xero Floor, uh, judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, the judgment starts out on the assumption that a fake court cannot be called a court and that any fake decision by a fake court, which is stuffed by fake individuals who shouldn't be sitting there, uh, cannot have any legal value whatsoever. And this judgment is about the Constitutional Court of the, of the Republic of Poland, uh, with regard to which the European Commission has done absolutely nothing and hasn't brought a single case. Uh, so, dereliction of duties it is, and, uh, and the, 
obviously the commission as a college should be profoundly ashamed of what it has, uh, of, of, of failing so many Europeans, really, especially uh, the Poles who were looking uh, at, uh, at, at Brussels with, uh, uh, with the eyes full of hope. If you look at the protests uh, that, that, that related to the abuse of the court when it all started, there were plenty, plenty of European flags. All those European flags are the hopes betrayed by the European Commission, every single one of them. So there is a huge difference between how all, this, uh, all these problems are approached by the Court of Justice in a very meticulous, rigorous, and, 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 and uh, proactive manner without, being, uh, the, without falling below the, the level of being absolutely legally convincing, and the commission, which fails to feed the court. Karen Alter said, uh, well, already years ago in one of her publications that if you don't ask the Court of Justice, the court won't tell. And this is exactly the problem that we are, fa that we are facing with the, with the commission uh, today. So the election of duties. Barbara, thank you, Dimitri. Uh, when it comes to new rule of law issues, I think we can um, look at the rule of law conditionality regulation and we can see that, first of all, there is a definition of the rule of law and one of the breaches of possible, one possible breaches is uh, limiting the availability of legal remedy, remedies, meaning uh, limiting the effectiveness of its investigation, prosecution, prosecution, sanctioning of breaches of the law. I think this is a clear uh, link with the independence of the prosecutor service as a kind of um, requirement that the rule of law consists of. I think this is a point that uh, both the commission and the, and the uh, court should um, just bear in mind. When it comes, to, you know, that Commissioner Jurova cannot lose a case, I think that what she cannot lose is lose Polish judges and Polish courts because otherwise it's exactly, it's a huge black hole on the map of the EU. And I don't think it's something you can put in your CV after, you know, ending your um, term as in, in the office. And the last point, I think it was mentioned already by Laura and, and Dimitri, uh, when you look at the Xero floor and uh, final ruling about the, the, the legality illegality of the constitutional tribunal which was given six years after the whole um, uh, history started i think this could have been done already before but as the uh, meeting mentioned that the ball had to be uh, thrown on on the, on the on the playground and if we want the court of justice to give a good shot we need to give them a chance to do so thank you very much as in, in the final round where everyone has one sentence or two sentences what do you expect to be the next difficult issue to be tackled by the court of justice dimitri compliance uh, i think if, if if compliance doesn't happen then there is no change on the ground so uh, we have we have an amazing case law now we have a rethinking profound rethinking of the constitutional essence of the EU going on in most practical sense, a different approach to the rule of law, but whether it will actually change the situation on the ground in Poland and Hungary is, a, is an open question. So it can be so that nothing actually improves in Poland as a result of this overwhelmingly uh, impressive case law. Thank you very much, Barbara. I think it will be about money, so also about implementation. I think only started with the Białowieża forest in 2017. I think the next step is the uh, tour of coal mine uh, in, in the south of Poland. The government already said they're not going to implement the interim measures. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it's, it's a purely rule of law issue. And, and the government says no. So we go, I think we need to see what's, what the commission is going to say after this no was said by the government. Very true. Thank you. And Laurent, the final word. Uh, obviously agree with Dimitri and Barbara. So let me just mention what I think is going to be uh, the most possibly uh, on top of this uh, another crucial challenge. Uh, interestingly, for the first time, the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights are about to deal with the same challenge together. So that's going to be interesting because we might see mutually reinforcing judgments from both the Strasbourg and the Luxembourg courts regarding what I have called in my scholarship uh, fake judges of uh, Poland. Uh, so the European Court of Human Rights is uh, about to find uh, the Supreme Court unlawfully composed in breach. I mean, my prediction is that uh, we're going to have a similar ruling in relation to the Supreme Court of Poland that we had in relation to the so-called Constitutional Tribunal. And there is also a very important uh, case in the pipeline uh, brought by two very brave uh, Polish judges about uh, the uh, imposters uh, uh, they had to deal with. 
uh, on the back of a completely uh, Kafkaesque disciplinary proceedings. This is going to be very interesting. People have, uh, we haven't mentioned this judgment, but there is a very important judgment and not issued in relation directly to national appointment procedures, but the Simpson judgment, which is in the case book essentially uh, has made uh, um, the principle of effective judicial protection uh, directly effective as regards national appointment uh, procedures. And Article 19, Paragraph 1 also is directly effective as well. So uh, this means plenty of legal ammunition for lawyers defending judges being harassed uh, in Poland especially. It's only a matter of time, in my view, uh, before we, are, uh, we need to confront uh, essentially what we're going to do with the 80,000 or 100,000 uh, uh, judgments illegally uh, issued uh, by irregularly uh, composed uh, benches. I mean, that's not the EU's fault or the Strasbourg's court fault, but this is essentially the result of many years of rule of law breakdown. So essentially, the worst uh, is uh, essentially we're not. Uh, um, I'm afraid uh, the worst. Uh, there's, the worst is yet to come. Uh, the situation is going to get much worse uh, before it gets better. Uh, however, we have a new stick as well uh, with the EU rule of law conditionality regulation. Uh, from my point of view, and just to end on this uh, statement, uh, it could already be activated right away uh, on the basis of uh, the overwhelming evidence of organized systemic uh, violation of the ECJ uh, case law against Poland. Uh, it would take me uh, a week uh, to write uh, the file uh, if I were being asked to do it. Uh, I think the evidence is overwhelming. You just have to really summarize it. I would say the same applies to Hungary, but not regarding judicial independence, uh, but as regards corruption or systemically organized uh, corruption uh, by uh, state officials. Uh, but perhaps uh, the EU is waiting for the US uh, to uh, adopt sanctions. I don't know, uh, maybe we should always wait for someone else to do the job. So hopefully uh, they're gonna wake up uh, before it's too late. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this extremely rich discussion. Uh, Laurent, Dimitri and Barbara, and thank you for the engaging questions uh, from the audience on behalf of the co-organizers, Reconstitution, Reconnect and the CEU Democracy Institute. Um, this talk uh, was recorded and it will be uploaded, so follow us on Facebook, Twitter and at our YouTube channel. See you next time. Thank you.